G'day legends. I hope that you're having a fantastic day and so far that you've had a fantastic weekend. I had a fantastic weekend. Now you'll notice I missed my video update yesterday. I was away with my partner for her birthday and we have missed a lot. And in this video, we're not going to catch up on everything. And as I've had some downtime, I have thought through some other things too. So the next few videos, we will do some catching up there as well. But what are we going to speak about today? Well, there's something that hasn't been spoken about much and we really, really need to cover it, is Ukraine's GUR, the main directorate of intelligence, has come out and said Commander-in-Chief Sersky has been compromised. So we need to look over that. No one's picking up on this. We need to look at that. Of course, we need to look at Ukraine's successful strikes over the last night as well. We need to look at claims of submarines being sunk, uh, oil depots that have been hit, airfields that have been hit. We'll look at the footage. We'll look at some other strikes as well in this. We need to look at Ukraine defaulting on loans. We need to talk about peace and where Ukraine, where Kiev has said that the peace uh, conference, the next one, may take place, as that's interesting in the location as well. And of course, we need to have a look at the maps and see where and what is changing. So no particular order. Let's go over this. Now, to keep you interested in the beginning, let's have a look at some strikes. Now, Rostov got hit. It was Rostov, and then the submarine, the Rostov named, was hit, well, claimed to be hit as well. So we'll have a look at some footage. So this is the Morozovsk airfield in then the Rostov region out here. Now, as you can see, now this is going to be very, very rough, but let's say out past Bakhmut, somewhere here, about 300 kilometres away from Ukrainian-controlled territory. Now, that's just the airfield, but there also was an oil depot in a similar region, or in Rostov as well, hit. And we have satellite imagery of this. So what we like, as we say, always, always, always wait for imagery. Everything has a camera from a satellite to your phone to your bloody fridge. So these are some of the uh, some of the footage we got. So you can see the oil depot, then tanks on fire here. Now, one thing I will say in this, and this isn't to downplay this as this is a big strike, but footage at night of something burning always looks a lot more dramatic than it may in the day, just because it's more light. So then we get more footage here as the sun is coming up of what is burning in here with these tanks. But as we can see, not all of these storage tanks have been hit and destroyed either. And we get a better idea of this when we come onto then the satellite imagery of the day prior and then overnight when they have been hit here. Now, I I can't say exactly how many, but I think at least these two, and I think at least these two, but I am not 100% sure exactly what has been burnt uh, and compromised in here. It may be significantly more than this as well. I'm just looking at where there are some burn and scorch marks from this. And there has been some conversation about how easy or hard these are to fix as well. Now, the big one was this huge, huge, huge explosion we saw at that airfield that I showed you off here. Now, if you're ever near an explosion like this, the heat can burn you from kilometers away as well. Stay away from anything like glass that could come up. As you can see, massive secondaries in here from then the ammo exploding in this depot. Now, one thing that was the initial thought of this airfield was fuel and ammo is one thing. It's more easily replaceable than airframes. And there's a number of airframes at an airfield like this. And what we what we know is the most important airframes, I believe, for Ukraine to hit with anything and try and limit Su-34s dropping the fabs. The TU aircraft, the long-range strategic bombers, they are doing strategic missions, hitting energy facilities, hitting this, hitting that. The tac the Su-34s, they're doing the tactical movements. That's half the reason, I believe, the front line has been grinding forward. They're not getting... They, they, can, they are seemingly to fly as much as they really want, and those fabs are causing absolute havoc on the front. But we have seen in some satellite imagery then today some of the burn marks as things have been on fire in here. Now, this isn't incredibly clear. We can see that an ammo storage area here has then been destroyed and has exploded. We're not exactly sure what was in that ammo dump here the day prior and then day after massive fires, but it doesn't seem these images, now the cloud's not great for us, 
it doesn't seem that there's any clear evidence of aircraft being hit. Now, the reason I showed you that this was 300 kilometers away, it's a long way. Remember, drones travel significantly slower than, say, a ballistic missile. 300 k's, let's just say the drone's traveling at 150 kilometers an hour. If Russia have early warning, even if they can't intercept all of these drones, they may have an hour of two or of warning of these coming in via radar. So that's an important piece we need to know as well, as aircraft are movable. So what is in one spot may be moved if it is AI targeting or it's set and forget targeting, as well as, of course, planes can get up in the air where the further away they're actually significantly safer up in the air. So what immediate effect will these strikes have? I don't believe it will see an immediate change, but again, it is showing that Ukraine is having deeper and deeper strikes against this. Now, I know there's claims around um, airframes. Air claims on airframes, to me, I need to see the airframe almost with my own two eyes in person to believe it now at this point. But there are more photographs as well. So Ukraine here has said more great news from the Ukrainian defenders. The units of missile forces uh, in Corporal Naval struck the S-400 air defense system in Crimea. As a result of the attack, four launches of the S-400 and they were damaged in here as well. So damaged, not destroyed, as some will say, of course, a very high-end air defense system. The photos, again, are not fantastic of what exactly has been hit. So the believes these are where the areas are and you can see where the fires have been burning. So again, we'll wait and see how significant the damage is on this. But we then will talk about the submarine and that will tie in with, uh, I think this was Reuters or Telegraph, but as well. So we'll read this part first, then we'll look at the sub. Officials in Kiev said the attack also destroyed four S-400 air defense systems. No, 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 not S-400 systems launches. Very, very different. If you're talking four batteries, then you're talking $4 billion compared to then four launches. And I'd say the same thing if there was a claim around four Patriot systems. Significantly different. But we have seen then this submarine. Now, of course, those strikes primarily were in the Rostov region. Now we have seen the Rostov and Don submarine said to be destroyed by Ukraine. Now, this is not the first time that this sub has actually been hit either, and it seems to have been dry docked since, and we reported on this uh, back last year. Kilo-class submarine launched in 2014 was in the Black Sea Fleet. Now, UK noted that last September, it likely suffered what they call catastrophic damage by the UK MOD um, in a missile strike undergoing maintenance while it was in a shipyard. So dry docked, and got hit. I don't know if you can call that sunk. You can definitely claim it as destroyed, but I think it needs to bump, 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 beneath the surface. Anyway, Ukraine's military said the, the outcome is the same. But subsequently, uh, actually, sorry, it could actually be worse because if you've got it then destroyed in the dry dock, you've got damage there, could be worse. Uh, said Russia subsequently repaired the vessel and was recently testing its capabilities near Sevastopol. The vessel is worth $300 million, which I actually think is very, very cheap for a submarine. Have a look at the Australian sub program and the tens of to hundreds of billions it's costing for six subs. The destruction of Rostov Dom once again proves there's no safe place for the Russian fleet in Ukrainian territorial waters. Now, again, we have some blurry images of this. Hopefully, we will get some better of this so it was damaged. It seems to have still been getting repaired and then has been hit again. So we can see there's like a dry dock here and they're saying that this blur we see here is where it's been damaged and then... We can see some images before of where the submarine was sitting in this same area. So again, this is just hard to see. So this is the zoom in of where it is sitting near these docks as well. So again, and you can see the difference between these. So it looks like the dock has been extended somewhat. It might have floated in, sunk, and that's how dry dock works. But not 100% sure on this. With any large claims, we need large evidence to come as well. Now we know TOS-1 Alpha... Of course, the flamethrower is a devastating weapon on the front line, and we're seeing it used here and there, but there has been problems with range and just the availability of the system as well. So we actually saw then yesterday, I saw Ukrainian pages release video of a drone then striking a TOS-1 Alpha. These systems are limited, but I will say we see then the massive explosion here as it hits on top of where that launcher is. Of course, this is a thermobaric weapon. 
incredibly devastating, especially against built-up positions. We can see, now I'm not saying this is the same system, but we know these are being used more and more because in the Zap Oblast, this is TOS-1 Alpha here working on Ukrainian positions then in this tree line. Absolutely devastating weapon of how a thermobaric works, especially against dug-in fortified positions. Now let's talk about peace and negotiations and then we'll look at the maps as well. So we have talked a lot that it seems to be a lot of signaling for peace. Now it this is what has come out of the last few days. The Global Peace Summit for Ukraine will be held in a country from the so-called Global South, probably in the Middle East, in an effort to portray the world's unity among Russia's ongoing invasion. This is from the head Andrew Yamak. That, they said, notably absent from the signatories in the last peace summit was then India, Armenia, Saudi Arabia, Libya, Indonesia. Now, Indonesia is looking at buying Russian oil. I believe it's probably going to be Saudi. We have seen Saudi uh, facilitate some of the uh, prisoner exchanges before. It may be that it's just what I'm thinking, potentially. No timeline has been given. They say that Russian representatives must be summons, uh, must be present, sorry. Um, if the world wants them, we can't be against it. So a few things. Who is the Global South? Well, I've had to draw in some lines on this, but this is basically the Global South. You've got the West and the South, and this divide is growing more and more, uh, further exacerbated by not only this war, but I think the war um, in Israel that is exacerbating this significantly more than anything else uh, than around the world as well, mixed in with uh, values shift as well. So... This is basically what we're looking at and what we were talking about before, that the communique failed to get signatories of the Global South. We can see here, we sort of overlap these maps from South America through Asia and Africa. We then see that it really did fail to get then the Global Souths um, to come together on this. And what has changed since then? I actually think since then it's got significantly worse with what is happening in with Israel, Lebanon, Israel, Gaza, and this is what I talk about. If you're having these in the Middle East, of course, the US is going to be a large part of this, Ukraine, uh, the Brits are going to be there, everyone will be there. The tensions in the Middle East, if there could be wider war by then, or of course, there's going to be still increased tensions. I can't see that turning back. It'll be very interesting to see how that happens, but Ukraine definitely needs to get the Global South on their side if they want more leverage against Russia. But again, how much leverage do they actually have? That is something we will wait and see. Andrea Mack are stating that the most important expectation of the second summit is for it to shape a major prerequisites for stopping the hostilities. We know Ukraine's prerequisites, the 10-point peace plan, and we also know those prerequisites at this point in time, the territorial integrity needs to be done, as I see, by military victories on the front. I don't know what sanctions or strategy could be in play to make Russia withdraw from those areas, especially including areas like Donetsk and Crimea. But we will see. Yumak said, we need to end this war as soon as possible to get just peace. Russia has previously said it will not attend a second peace summit. And what Russia is saying, and China has said similarly about the first, is it needs to be based on the reality on the front line. And what is the reality at the moment? The reality is Russia is making ground every day, and the sanctions have not hit Russia as hard. That is then the reality. And to go into this and say, we want all the territorial integrity, although you may be, you know, the right or morale, ethically, of it doesn't matter. The Russians are going to sit and why would we even bother attending if that is where this is then starting, that a negotiation means a negotiation. Now, this is what uh, one of my guys sent to me about this. Um, you said you think negotiations seem likely at the end of the year. There are certainly signs that Ukraine would like that, but I've seen zero evidence of any Russian interest so far. I fear there may be a lot of wishful thinking involved here, as many analysts seem to assume that Russia is just desperate to freeze the conflict or something like that. But I suspect that's the very last thing that they would want, because of course the war is over, and if they believe they can continue going, they will continue going. And I've talked about how does Russia interpret, how do they interpret that now Ukraine is talking about peace and negotiations and peace conferences with Russia when for two and a half years there's always been we'll not speak to Russia if Putin's in power, we'll not have anything, blah, blah, blah. 
what has then shifted and how would you read into that? Would you read into that as, okay, they might, they it must be on the back, back foot at this point and must be more desperate. Let's continue the war as they may be assuming that we will win if there isn't a negotiation. I could be wrong on that. I'm just saying that's how I think that they would be then seeing this. Now, let's have a quick look at the maps. We don't have that much to go over, but of course, here is Ukraine, the center, the capital of Kiev, the red areas occupied since 22, the purple since 2014. And we will be looking back over then two days, but there's no dramatic shift. So let's come down into Avdivka first. And we see out near Zeleny, we just see small Russian push into these first blocks of Zeleny here. And what I believe they'll be trying to do is come down and then get Novozelenny here. And of course, what this is going to do, if the Russians can get down into here somewhere, it is going to put this whole front area, because of course, these reservoirs through here, it's going to put all of this through here at risk of envelopment. So we may see a withdrawal out of here. Timeline on that, I could not tell you from a bar of soap, but I believe that is the moves we'll see to try and shorten this front line and push forward through the defensive works that then lay in here because you're better off trying to go around and envelop a defensive work at work and have then the opposing force withdraw rather than fighting then through that defensive work, although that it's not always possible. So let's have a look at Avdivka on then Suryak. Again, he's showing up more movement, but again, is showing in the same direction here. So we know there has been some Russian movement over the last 48 hours in this direction. Now, we'll just come east of here. Remember, this is on the 3rd and on the 4th. We'll skip forward a day in a second. We see just a little bit of Russian movement in Zelezny here. This is what I call the New York or Toretsky front. So a little bit of movement here. Let's see how this is looking then on the map. Bang, same spot, about the same. Not even going to read through it. If both maps here, I'm calling that enough for me to suggest and say that there was movement there. Now, let's step forward onto then today's map. Now, what this is showing is Russia has made movement out of Novoselivskia, Persia, down in this direction. Again, what I'll say in here is where Ukraine can actually get out of this area in here is very, very limited. This is all grey zone in here. I don't believe you want to be coming out through this road. So in here, you have, where do I measure? Let's go... Let's go here to, let's go to gray zone. You've got about a kilometer of flat open ground in here, couple of tree lines. I think we will see Ukraine have a withdrawal out of here and this then fall. That said, and I'm going to be a prick here. There's been a lot of times when Ukraine has not given the order for guys to withdraw and then areas come under control and there'd be a desperate situation of withdrawal. Prohez was the most recent example of that, although that movement there is not being backed up on the maps, so although I will say if it's on this map showing Russian movement, I will say then it occurred. Now, Shasiv Yar, this is, I think, the most interesting update we've seen for a while. What we see is that Russia has successfully then crossed the reservoir or the waterway that runs through here. I've said that this will be incredibly difficult and incredibly costly. Now, this does not mean that they'll hold this at all, because of course, everything needs to cross here. Once you get X far in, then you need to cross, then you're supporting elements as well. Now, this isn't how I said I thought this would occur. I thought they'd try and get more in the north here to try and secure a better crossing. I'm not a bloody colonel on the ground. I don't have everything available to me. Maybe there's an, a, a way to cross here, but we have seen that deep state map is confirming Russia in those first blocks. And then we see an, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, so we don't have that then shown on this, but we do have a Bakhmut map just to the south of here. So we look at Klishkivka, uh, Ivanivsky, and then we have just some movement down from Ivanivsky down in here by the Russians, but not too much in here. He's saying no significant changes, but I will say if the deep state showing that, I'll say that that has most likely occurred. Now, those are the last movements we see on this map, but... Syriac is saying that Ukraine did make some ground back around Makivka in here. Now, of course, we saw this push out, I want to say about three weeks ago. I could be incorrect, but it's saying Lugansk front. In the last two weeks, Ukraine only managed to recapture most of the locality of Makivka. Oh, God, I got hiccups. So and Ukraine has been able to push back into some of the gray zone here and recapture some of that, not being shown then across the maps. And then in Volchansk, there is said to be a map correction of ground as well by Syriac here. On then the western side, to have access to new corrections made, showing the border positions. Northwest Staritsia uh, was also retaken by Ukrainian Army 
between the last days of June and first weeks of July. So down in this area here. But that will then fix our maps for the date. Now, I want to talk about this thing with the main director of intelligence, the GUR in Ukraine. Now, first things about this. So Sarah Ashtrilio has put this People love to meme on Sarah Ashton Drillio, whatever, regardless of what you think of themselves, what they say, whatever. They are a ranked employed member of the main directorate of intelligence of Ukraine. What I will say is this is not her speaking just herself. That's not how it works in soldiers. Sarah is being used here as a mouthpiece, as the person with the following to put word out from higher. That is how I, of course, see this. And this is large claims, and I think this isn't being reported on at, at all, and it's very interesting that it is not. So, again, employed, uniformed member of the Directorate of Intelligence. She has not gone just on Twitter herself, film this, and put it up. Now, the office of Colonel General Sursky is compromised by foreign influence. Documents and messages indicate the Ukrainian commander-in-chief's office is being manipulated into ignoring the civilian chain of command. President Zelensky and Minister Umrov must investigate. So going around the normal chain here. Now, people have then said this. We'll watch it in a second. But regardless of what information you may or may not have, this is a massive breach of proper military decorum and realistically a court-martial offence, plus undermining confidence in Ukraine wild. Now, I have a diff I agree with this, but what I will say on this is most of the time when people in the military or people in intelligence or people in the police force go public with something is because it's being ignored through the correct channels. Look at that through things in Australia, things in America where people go public with things because they've gone, I've tried the correct channels, I've tried the chain of command, I've tried XXX, it's, not, it's being ignored, it's not working, therefore I have to go public and make a song and dance, and then it can't be ignored. We used to always say in the military was, if if my leave app doesn't get assigned or whatever, next thing you'll see me crying on 60 minutes. <laughs> like, you know, anyway. The, let's look at actually what was said and what she has shown as well. Good afternoon. Slava Ukraini. My name is Sarah Ashton Cirillo, and I'm a sergeant in the Ukrainian Defense Forces, serving in a special operations unit of Defense Intelligence of Ukraine, better known as GUR. So Special Operations Unit in GUR, again, putting there where this is then coming from. Five weeks ago, information came to me that the office of the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, Colonel General Sierski, had been compromised by foreign actors in a deliberate attempt to embarrass the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense at the international level. So f compromised by foreign actors to embarrass Ukraine at the international level. These are... Very, very large claims. One thing I will say on a personal note to Sarah, be careful with some of this as well with how some things work in other areas of the globe. That's, look after yourself. Anyway. While increasing the fortune and influence of individuals from multiple partner states. After confirming the validity of a letter sent by Colonel General Sierski to a member of the United States Congress, and being given additional letters and text messages related to efforts by the alleged conspirators to bypass Ukraine's democratically elected civilian chain of command. So what is happening here is Sursky is going to X person himself rather than through the normal chains. I brought my concerns to three separate command verticals, all inside the defense forces. All attempts to ensure a proper investigation were ignored. Bang. Exactly what I said in the beginning. I brought my attempts to three areas of chain of command or ignored. This is exactly why then this will be public. And worse. Happens in all militaries. With much soul searching, I realized I have to appeal directly to our Supreme Commander in Chief, Ukraine's duly elected president, Volodymyr Zelensky, and our Minister of Defense of the Ukrainian Defense Forces to begin immediate investigations into this foreign influence on both Ukraine's military chain of command and potential leaks of highly sensitive military information, as well as the already mentioned attempts to undercut Minister Rustem Umarov. Additionally, I call 
on officials in the United States to begin an immediate and diligent investigation into the parts played in this affair by American citizens, which seemingly includes significant violations of U.S. law. Every Ukrainian that I have known who has suffered for the past 10 years, in the two and a half years I've been here, who have suffered under the blunt hammer of Soviet-style mindsets and the pervasive influence of corruption, have willingly sacrificed in every way to drive out the genocidal Russian invaders and guarantee victory today and guarantee a winning future tomorrow for Ukraine. To see Ukraine's pillars of democracy undercut and the rule of law so easily flouted at the highest levels of military command does dishonor to every one of my fallen colleagues and every Ukrainian who has sacrificed. Below you will find several images that I have redacted but wanted to put out so you would have a better idea of just where this investigation needs to go. Slava Ukraini and Godspeed. One thing I will say to this is anything pre-22 talks about that there is corruption, there is foreign influence. There's all this in the senior ranks of the Ukrainian government and militaries as well. And since then, it has been almost like taboo to talk about this. And I believe doing an absolute disservice to that too, because that is like malignant cancer when you've got people in high positions, not willing to push things up the chain of command, hiding things and corruption as well. Now, many will say you're, you're just critical nitpicking at this. No, it is very um, prominent in chains of command up high and in government in Ukraine as well. It is. Now, I'm not saying that doesn't exist in Western countries, but it's far more obvious in Ukraine too. And it is doing a disservice to those on the front line, as Sarah is pointing out here, I think may have had her eyes open to how some workings actually then may work here too. So let's look at what she has released here as well. Now, <clears throat> letter from Colonel General Sersky, Congressman Austin Scott. Uh, requesting highly sensitive weapons. These weapons were not intended for the armed forces and the letter was requested by foreign groups. This was done to bypass and embarrass the Ukrainian MOD. Now, so, uh, sorry, urgent uh, situation involved chance. I kindly request your assistance to colleagues of Congress, blah, 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 for, and we don't really get exactly what this is. Who is the foreign groups requesting this? So it, it's, this is, I wish this wasn't as, Redacted. Maybe if nothing happens, we'll get then unredacted. Same private foreign group engaged a Ukrainian defense firm to source and purchase 220 tons of explosive while the Ukrainian armed forces itself is in great need of, of the same ordnance. So there's foreign groups here requesting straight through the chain of command rather than up for the military then itself. Now, if the GUR isn't tracking this, and of course, GUR intelligence director, it should know what other foreign groups and other groups which may be out of the typical funding of the armed forces, if they're not tracking it, I'd be concerned at exactly what is actually going on here. And then Sersky can go directly then through the Pentagon, one of the alleged foreign conspirators, explaining why they manipulated Colonel Sersky in writing letters. They wanted to bypass the MOD so they can give weapons to private groups. So massive concern. This is a bigger story than I think it's getting, um, than it's getting its than the attention it is getting. So let me know what you think of this. But to say that that doesn't exist, and I'll say again, and you can hate me all you want, I support the people on the ground, the governments, some of the upper echelon. It's not what it may be portrayed through the mainstream media. Now, as well, we need to speak on this of credit ratings and defaults on loans. We know this has been likely coming and then it has happened that Ukraine is defaulting or then SD on loans as well. Now, when we talk SD, what do we mean? Is selective default, so not a total default, but there are areas which may be defaulting. That this is the credit rating given a company or government came back to ability to borrow money. Governments borrow money just like companies, although things aren't liquidated as easily as then a company, and we'll talk about this, but flagging up the amount of risk that it's likely to impose investors High risk uh, ratings like SD may not appeal as much to generally investors. So if you're defaulting, you're not going to look at investing or you may not actually be able to borrow. 
Um, SD is generally seen to be outside the main credit ratings table, which runs from AA, very top, to the way down to D at the very bottom. We'll look at these ratings as well, and we'll look at where Ukraine is currently sitting. So this is from the S&D, so Standards & Poor's Ukraine, um, rated lowered to SD on missed coupon payments. So we understand Ukraine intends to launch formal restructuring of euro bonds through an exchange offer, so changing this to try and extend it through the International Monetary Fund. The government decided to suspend payments on uh, affected bonds during then the restructuring. Um, we therefore lowered our long-term and short-term foreign currency on ratings from uh, Ukraine SD and SD, selective default from CCC, uh, and our issue ratings on 2026 euro bond D from 2CC. We also firm CC. Um, remaining uh, senior unsecured foreign currency debt issues. At the same time, we refer, if you want the CCs, give it a second. Triple C plus, C local currency. Uh, we understand Ukraine's Grivna denominated government debt is not in scope for debt restructuring. So you can't just change when you've got your own currency too. So this is what we're looking at. This is where things are moving. So things have moved from CCC. So insurer currently vulnerable default is likely that then CC is highly vulnerable near default. And then you've got SD and forget this row here, uh, SD and D lowest rating typically in default on some or selectively default on financial obligations. And this can impact Ukraine's ability to borrow where they can borrow from and where other money needs to then come into Ukraine. The SD and CC lower the rating on these euro bonds too. So let's continue on this. If this isn't making sense, give it a bit, and we'll talk about it more. I've got a guy that specifically deals in this. They reflect the mispayment of coupon for these bonds. They're given a grace period of 10 days. Of course, not going to make this, but um, new ones that will imply a nominal haircut of 37 cent, uh, interest payment relief, and extension of maturity dates moving forward. Debt restructuring follows the government's effort. So they're trying to do this. We're trying to restructure of how we can make this up. Service pressure on restore public debt and sustainability as part of its ongoing um, fund Facilitate arrangement with the IMF. We know billions of dollars are coming from the International Monetary Fund to Ukraine and being done with G7 nations and Paris Club members. Deferred payments on official bilateral debt until the IMF program 2027. So pushing that back. That said, we do not know. We do not know how things will look in 2027. This is an important piece to go in here. Air is occupied by Russian forces, account for some 15% of Ukraine's territory and 8 to 9% of its pre war GDP. Almost one third of Ukraine's population has been displaced and 15% have now left the country and are now refugees. This has a massive, massive effect on Ukraine's GDP and shrinking economy, uh, sorry, shrinking um, population. If the economy started to recover, considering the toll the war has retaken on Ukraine's economy, we do not expect real GDP to recover to its pre-war level in our forecast period through 2027. So, even if recovering, by then it's going to take a very, very long time. That said, post-war economies can bounce back unbelievably, even if you lose. Look at Japan and Germany. Now, furthermore on this, are default and bankruptcy synonyms? Now, default can be compared with an enterprise bankruptcy as an enterprise can be liquidated as a result of bankruptcy. A country cannot be liquidated. It continues to exist and function, although foreign markets are closed for this country for some five to seven years, so it can no longer borrow money. During this time, the country can get funding only from such organisations as the IMF, the World Bank, and the like, other governments. So selectively defaulted to here. One of the things I've talked about with Ukraine, I think this could be a concern going into the future with for um, sovereignty as well. We know these giga behemoths like Vanguard and BlackRock are stepping in and buying just massive sloths of like farming land and all this as well. And this is, of course, going cheap because of pieces like this and Ukraine's ability to borrow for arming or uh, then reconstruction. So I guess this is something that will come. I've got a guy who's going to speak to me directly about what this then means. Legends, that was all I had for you today. A lot more coming in the next few days. Have a fantastic day, and I'll speak to you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye.